All right, guys, today was round 11 of the Tata Steel Chess Tournament. The top four was facing each other and we were expecting a big, massive battle between those four players. It was Anish Giri versus Nutterbeck at the Satorov, Magnus Carlsen against Wesley So. But guess what? They all drew six games out of seven in the Masters drew today. And you might think, oh, but maybe there was some excitement going on. No, not at all. There's not much else to say. I'm kidding. Let's continue. We're going to take a look how the game between Magnus and Wesley So ended in a draw. What happened there? And I will make some interesting notes about the game. And I also picked three games on top of that. One from the Masters, the one decisive result, and two other games from the Challengers, which were actually really exciting and fun to watch. Let's take a look. So first, the game between Magnus Carlsen and the Wesley So. Magnus and Wesley are on 6 out of 10, both are sharing 3rd place and they are 1 point behind the leader Nutterbeck of the Sotarov. So this game is pretty important, however, you may already know the results, let's take a look how that happened. <laughs> D4 was played, knight f6, c4, e6, knight c3 and bishop b4. This is the Nimzo Indian defense. And here, Wesley So went for the line with c5. You always have to be careful here when you play the move c5 that your bishop on b4 does not get trapped. I am guilty myself of this that I trapped my bishop number of times and that's not a fun uh, time. You have to be very precise in this position with the black pieces. Knight e2 was played, d5, a3, takes, takes. Typically, when you capture a knight for your bishop, you want to have some compensation for that because you're basically voluntarily giving up your bishop pair. And most of the times in the Nimzo Indian, what you hope with the black pieces is that, is that they take with the b-pawn. But in this case, that's not the case. The knight captured back. There's no pawn structure being destroyed here. So, yeah. That's maybe not so ideal. However, after c takes d4, e takes d4, d takes d4, and bishop takes, we are now in a position with the isolated queen's pawn. That means that typically when you're facing the queen's pawn, it is pretty nice to have knights because knights are good pieces to block the pawn. And on top of that, the focus of black is to trade pieces. The more pieces are traded off the board, the weaker this pawn actually gets. So for that reason, white does not want to trade, and instead white wants to attack the king, the opponent's king. So as soon as short castle will happen, bishop g5 comes to mind, maybe bishop b3, bishop c2, queen d3, and you target this pawn on h7, as well as the king on g8. So those are the main ideas for white here, and of course black is going to try to prevent that and trade as many pieces as possible. So knight c6 was played, bishop e3, castles, castles, they just played a few moves here. And in this position, Magnus played the move d5, which is rather surprising. Usually when players go for such a position, they don't really want to go for a move like d5 so quickly. Because if you play d5, that means you remove all sorts of imbalances that you created in this position. You're entering a position where there is a lot of equality, there is not a lot of weaknesses on either side, and it's really hard to find ways to find an advantage somewhere. And typically, when you have your pawn on d4, as I mentioned, white is going for some sort of attack. So a move that comes to mind is queen f3, bishop d3, maybe bishop b3 to once again go for that plan with the bishop on c2 and a queen on d3, and attack on the king side. However, in this situation, now that Magnus played d5, this is absolutely not happening. Takes, takes, and here we see some trades. The knights got traded off, the bishops as well. And here we're in a position where it's almost symmetrical. I mean, there is no weaknesses to be found in this position. The best I can find is that maybe a knight can be placed on b3 or on c4. And yeah, there's not much else than that. At the same time, so here we have a bishop versus knight situation. And you might say that, oh, that's still an imbalance, right? But it's really hard to find ways where either side can make use of this imbalance. Because 
bishops are pretty good when it comes to having pawns on two sides of the board. Um, if the pawns are on one side of the board, then it's very easy for the knight to maneuver around and um, yeah, take opportunities. But in this situation, the knight has to maneuver a lot, make a lot of moves to even access one side of the board. And if the action switches to the other side, it is really difficult for the knight to switch back very quickly. So that is the upside, the advantage of this bishop. But the knight is not really in such need to maneuver around that much. It can simply stay on the queen side. So, for that reason, there's not a lot to be found here for either side. So let's see how they continue. Queen a4, here we go. And yeah, they just traded off the rooks. And it feels like it was bound to happen that from the very start, they were going for this situation. And neither side really had anything going on here. They were just moving pieces around, traded off queens. It was bishop versus knight endgame. And yeah, nothing much really happened. We're just scrolling through the moves because they played, I mean... You might see some question marks here and there, but there's not much to be done wrong here. Other than, for example, removing the knight and dropping the pawn. Um, but yeah, it's really difficult to make a mistake here. Even though Magnus was very low on the clock around this move, it is pretty easy to hold the draw here. He like, traded off pawns, and yeah. The less pieces on the board, the easier it is to make a draw for either side. And what was interesting that in this situation, actually, they repeated moves a few times, but not three times. And Magnus actually went for the move g4 here, avoiding repetition and simply continuing the game. So he's still fighting for a win, which is pretty interesting to see after his decision. Remember in the middle game where he played d5? But okay. They continue, moves here and there, and I also want to know that, notice how the knight has been playing so many different moves, whereas the bishop is simply just going back and forth. I mean, it's not really doing much, but also at the same time, it doesn't have to do much. It can simply stay on e1 and cover both sides of the board. So, yeah, that goes to show how useful this bishop is. However, there's nothing that white really can make use of this small advantage, I would say. So here... We see a trade again. Make sure to not take on e5. That is only making, you know, your life harder. Because only black could be winning there. It is still interesting to see if this is actually winning uh, for black. I don't think it should because after king of three, if you run towards this pawn, at the same time, white will be able to capture this pawn and it should be a draw. Black doesn't have to go for this. King of three, you can simply face it with... Uh, King f5, and uh, yeah, <laughs> there's no trouble there for black. So there's no need to take on e5 whatsoever, and that is why king f4 was played, knight g6, king g5, and this looks like white is taking the upper hand, right? Almost uh, able to capture this pawn h5, and once that h pawn is off the board, it becomes much easier to, you know, make something out of the position. But there's one catch. Knight takes h4. And initially, the engine said this was a mistake, and I had to correct it because it is not a mistake whatsoever. This move is, well, pretty much the best move, I would say, because after king takes h4, the position we are approaching to is a position where um, we have a pawn on the edge of the board. This pawn is moving up, and we have to look at the promotion square. It is a light square. And our bishop is a dark square. This is a theoretical draw. As long as the king is near the promotion square, so it can actually cover the pawn, you know? As long as the king is nearby and this king is far away, this is a draw. So for that reason, um, and Engine said that this move, bishop g7, was a huge blunder, but it's not. Um, if you simply stay on e1, king b5, and imagine you allow white to capture the pawn a6 but you're just putting your king all the way to a8 there is no way for white to win that endgame so knowing that magnus of course is not going to you know drag it out any longer plays bishop g7 and allows wesley to capture that pawn and boom two kings on the board automatic draw nothing too crazy happened in this game but i thought the end game was still educational to see you know it may look a bit scary, but it was a draw all along, and uh, yeah, 
pretty easy. <laughs> so on that note, we are moving on to games that actually had a decisive result. The first game we're going to look at is still from the Masters. It is the game between Pragnananda and Parha. This game was pretty crazy. Let me show you why. So Pragnananda opens with e4. We see Sicilian defense and we see the Nidorf. The Nidorf with the move h3. And it gets even wilder. Knight of three. Typically, knight b3 is played. Let me show you. So knight b3 is typically played here. However, Prague goes back to f3. And after queen c7, knight h2. I have never seen knight h2 so early in the Sicilian. It is a very typical move here that after knight h2, you know, the idea is to make space for this pawn to play f4 and at some point maybe even knight g4. You can also go back to f3, but the idea is simple. You want to allow it to play f4. But what is the idea behind this when your knight could have gone to b3 and f4 would have happened anyways? Let's see what Prague had in mind. Knight bd7. Knight g4, there the knight goes, and unfortunately for Prague, it is not really desirable to take on f6 because there's a knight covering that, and controlling the square d5 will be a little bit difficult and not really ideal. So knight e3 was played, knight b6, this knight is uh, willing to go to d5 of course, which comes from the Sushnikov pretty much, where white is often trying to fight for the square d5, and black often wants to take control over the square d4. But in this situation, it doesn't really feel like black is really aiming for that. a3 was played, stopping any sort of b4. Bishop e7, bishop d3, bishop e6, queen f3, g6. This all looks pretty normal. Knight d7, bishop d2, knight c5, nothing too crazy. And after short castle, Pragnananda played the move knight to f5, which is, according to the computer, a big mistake. Now, you may think like, wait, why is Prag doing this? Why is he sacrificing his knight? This pawn can simply capture it, right? Well, the thing is that after g takes f5, you're exposing your king so much. There is so much space around this king. So after g takes, e takes f5 will be played and here black will start having problems with the king. The bishop comes to h6, queen comes to g4, f6 can be played at some point and sooner or later if black isn't careful it will be checkmate. So this is the reason why Pragnananda played the move knight f5. It's a very thematic move in these type of positions where there's not a lot of pieces around black's king and even if there's a pawn on g6 it will not really be able to capture that knight on f5. It's not really recommended. Um, unless, you know, you're not afraid of any sort of attack. <laughs> I would be. But the thing is, the reason why knight f5 is not a great move is because of bishop takes f5, which is played by Parham. And I will show you why. After e takes f5, Parham plays the move d5. Wow. And look how strong a black center is. One of the main moves in a Sicilian for black is to play the move d5. Once you get this pawn on d5, white could almost resign. Almost. I wouldn't dare to say that you, can, you always have to resign, but once black gets d5 through, you will have a very hard time with the white pieces. So, the reason why... And this game will also illustrate why the center is so important. Why doesn't have a single pawn in the center? I mean, this pawn f5 is not doing anything. Nothing. Nada. You're not going to access the king that easily. Bishop h6 was played. Rook fd8, rook ad1. And boom, e4. This is where the party starts for black. Queen g4, knight a4. Takes, takes. And look at the position. Why it doesn't really have an attack? It feels like this bishop is so close to the king, his queen is nearby, but how do you actually execute any sort of plans here? Because the king is simply safe there. The pawns are covering the king super well, and if only white had a knight, for example, on f4, to capture that pawn on g6 and break the king open. But that's not the case. White only has those bishops, and look at this poor bishop on e2, it is so passive. And this is why having a center, having control over the center, is so important. If it wasn't for this pawn, bishop d3 would have been possible, 
and then bishop takes g6 so that's why you have to be so careful with your center and now prague plays a move f4 which is very much hated by the computer but honestly I wouldn't know what else to do here. It looks horrendous for white. The pawn on b2 is hanging. The pawn on c2 is hanging. Black has this beautiful center here where you cannot do anything about it. And one thing that Prague can try to do is to really attack that king over here. With the move f5, capture that pawn g6, and, you know, break open the king as much as possible. Queen b6 was played. King h1, f5, and... Yeah, this is pretty much saying goodbye to any sort of attack. Your f5 move is never happening. And look how smart and clever Parham was here with the move queen b6. It was an intermediate check to defend the pawn on g6. And after the move f5, letting go of that pawn on g6, the queen is still protecting that. And now stopping any sort of f5 like this. So yeah, very well played by Parham. Queen g3. And now there goes the first pawn. Knight c4, king h7 takes and doesn't take the bishop back on c4. No, goes for the other bishop. Bishop b3, rook c8. And Parham is simply converting the advantage effortlessly. Look at that. Rook c3 is coming in. Look at those pawns. I mean, it's just disgusting to look at. It's disgusting. You know, I wish I could flip the board because I don't like seeing this from White's perspective. It's not fun at all. Queen h4. There comes d3, as if things couldn't get any worse. g3 was played. Now, look at that. Param is ignoring it. The queen is under attack and he's simply ignoring it. And the reason why is because if you take, rook takes d1. After queen takes, pawn takes, bishop takes. I mean, it's not going to be like that loss right away, but okay. I mean, there's a, <laughs> a lot of pawns missing in white's camp. You can simply capture that pawn. There's no need to play rook c1 to capture that bishop. This bishop is bad anyways. You're just simply going to save your own bishop and you will collect those pawns very soon. Your pawns are not going anywhere. They're as strong as it can get. And for that reason, uh, rook takes d8 was played. Bishop takes, g takes h4, and there comes a queen, another queen on the board, rook takes, and this is pretty much the same position as I was just talking about, rook a6, rook c3, bishop e6, and yeah, Param is simply converting this so effortlessly, and he doesn't even care about his pawns, because he knows the power of this pawn, and of course, king h7 was played, not king h5, that is asking for trouble, Rook g1, e2, bishop b5, and guess in what way Parham finished the game? Pause if you want to solve. Rook h2. Wow. Wow. After king h2, the only move that could be played, bishop takes g1. <laughs> Mind blowing. Because after king takes g1, you queen, and that's it. That's it. And after rook h2, that was a moment that Pragnananda thought, this is enough, it's over. And what a beautiful game played by Parham. That was really, really awesome and fun to look at. And I'm not sure about the opening of Prague. The opening was not so bad, I guess. It didn't really feel like he was getting much out of the opening, but it also didn't feel like he was really, like, you know, down a lot of... Um, Tempe. I mean, he did spend some time with the knight maneuver on the king's side, but in the end, it felt okay. It was simply that knight f5 move that he played that he miscalculated and, you know, misjudged it. So, yeah, that was a one very exciting game from the Masters. Now let's switch to the challenges because there were two very exciting games over there. Let's have a look what happened there. So the first game I want to discuss is the game between Alexander Donchenko and Amin Tabatabai. Alexander Donchenko has been leading throughout the tournament in the challengers. Can he maintain the lead over there? Let's find out. Knight of three was played. Knight of six. So this opening was pretty safe, an English opening. Um, Alexander took it very slowly and easy. Nothing too crazy until this moment. Knight b5 was played. This is one of those situations where it's often recommended to play c6 with the black pieces but c6 was not played and for that reason knight b5 comes suddenly on the board very annoying to be honest bishop e7 was played not allowing the bishop to be captured bishop e5 knight a6 bishop e2 c6 and look how uncomfortable black's pieces are knight c3 knight c5 
The knight jumps into the center but has to retreat again. Yeah, that's not really uh, fun times, huh? There we see b6, h3, bishop b4, bishop h2. Very safe and sound. And it's crazy that on move 17, white is still able to play d4 like nothing happened in, you know, the first 16 moves. <laughs> Rook c8, rook d1, and here Amin decides to take on c3 for the simple reason that, I mean, this bishop is not really doing much, and this knight looks pretty scary, and Amin has a clear plan. c5. The reason why is because he is going to control the square e4 with the knight. So that's why he wanted to get rid of that knight on c3. a4, knight e4, queen b3, c takes, e takes. Um, those pawns in the center are called hanging pawns, they can be pretty annoying to deal with, I mean, for both sides, because, well, they're pretty vulnerable, but they're also controlling many squares. This square, this square, this square, and that square, they're all covered by the pawns. So, yeah, that restricts the mobility of those pieces, of course. So, knight e6 was played, rook c1, and yeah, I mean, it's trying to do something against those pawns in the center, but look at what Alexander is doing here. Queen b1, h6, c5! That move is really crushing it because this bishop is in a very sad situation. The pawn is pinned because of this queen on b1 uh, sniping across this file. And this pawn is now attacked three times and only defended twice. So what do you do about that? And I mean, play the move bishop takes f3, which is not favored by engine, but the idea is very understandable. He simply wants to be able to free his pieces and be able to capture that pawn on c5 without losing material. So he did sacrifice the bishop pair for this, but yeah, he is able to take on c5. And now there's a small problem in Amin's position. The rook on c8 is trapped. This bishop is covering the squares b8 and c7. So Amin has to give up the exchange and it's pretty much over. Here, if black plays, rook takes or queen takes b7, the knight falls after queen takes c5. So that's why knight takes b7 was played. And one more time, the pin on the b file is devastating for black a6. And there's nothing you can do about this. e5 was played. Of course, I mean, it's still going to try because look at the knight on d4. It looks actually pretty nicely over there. There's nothing that I mean can really do here because, yeah, if it wasn't for this pawn on b7, I would say that I mean still had chances, maybe even to win. Because if you look at it this way, knight and two pawns versus rook, that can still mean something. But this pawn is really what is making it possible for white to win here without this pawn it would have been very difficult with this pawn it is very easy to win let's put it that way <laughs> knight f3 was played king h1 knight h4 a cheeky checkmate threat over here of course that is not missed by alexander first they uh give a check king h7 and after rook g1 covering that square g2 there's nothing that black can do to stop the threats here stop promotion whatsoever and that's why i mean resigned here in case uh black could still try some few moves queen d6 was possible to you know defend the rook and not allow promotion that easily but the problem is rook takes queen takes queen c2 check and after move like g6 queen c8 and that's it you cannot stop the promotion whatsoever so very fun game played by alexander donchenko and he is taking the lead in the challengers once again he is half a point ahead of number two in the standing so let's see if he can still hold on to this uh, number one spot for the remaining two rounds in this tournament the final game we're going to take a look at is the game between international master Thomas Beertsen from the Netherlands against Grandmaster Velimir Ivic from Serbia. Both players are above 2500. As you can see, Thomas is above 2500, but is not a Grandmaster just yet. So can he make it happen to gain a Grandmaster norm in this tournament to finally get that Grandmaster title? Let's find out. In this game, he played the move e4, as you could already see. c5 was played, knight f3, knight c6, and they played the Rosolimo. g6, short castle, bishop g7, c3 was played, and here, knight f6. All very standard moves. Rook e1, short castle, d4 was played, which is really interesting, actually, because 
Typically, when you play the Rosa of Limo, you want to keep it closed. So you play very safe moves like D3, um, Knight D2, and then you will see where the Knight goes to. Sometimes it goes to F1, to G3, E3. Sometimes you switch to the Queen side. Uh, but White decided to play D4. And here, A6 was played, and after Bishop takes, D takes C6, H3. C takes D4, C takes D4. So Black did solve their problem with the pawn structure, but once again, look at the center. Looks pretty terrifying. C5 was played, D5, not allowing the pawns to be traded whatsoever. We do have to keep in mind that Black has the bishop pair. So you may want to not open the position with the white pieces for that reason as well. B5 was played, gaining space on the queen side, knight c3, bishop b7, bishop f4, rook e8, bishop e5, which is a really crazy move, and bishop h6, like what? What is going on? Bishop on e5 is so unusual, but we also saw in this other game that the bishop got to e5, and it's, it's pretty crazy that such unusual moves are being played, but, you know, it's still fine. Queen c2, knight d7, bishop g3, c4. Black is getting a lot of space on the queen side, but is it enough to deal with the fact that white has a massive pawn chain here in the center, having so much space and opportunities here in the center? Rook AD1, knight c5. Okay, the knight is jumping to d3, but Thomas is like, no, 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 knight e5. We're not allowing the knight to jump to d3. Rook c8, knight e2, f6. Knight g4. Bishop g7, knight f4, the knights are jumping around, and Thomas is very ambitious here. H4 is played by him. He is focusing on the king side because, well, the king side doesn't really have many pieces left. All of those pieces are pretty much focused on the queen side, and this lonely bishop on g7 may have a hard time dealing with the attack. Let's see. A5, h5, g5, knight e2, all right. Not allowing the, the king side to be weakened more. e5, whew. Crazy. h6, bishop f8, knight c3, rook d8, the start of problems. Or is it? Rook e3. So apparently the top move here was to capture on b5, which is mind-blowing. Absolutely crazy. After queen takes b5, there are moves like knight takes f6, winning the pawn over there. And black may be in huge trouble here because the king side is falling apart completely. This pawn is hanging. This pawn is becoming a big target as soon as the queen will be able to join the attack on the king side. Black will be in huge trouble here. But of course, this is very risky to go for and not that straightforward and easy to see. So for that reason, rook e3 was played. Just taking it easy. Why go for knight takes b5 when you can simply, you know, Guarantee yourself the attack. Bishop e7, defending the pawn on f6. Rook f3 was played. Knight d3, a4. And here there is some action happening on the queen side. Knight goes to f4. And now, of course, Thomas is trying to get his knight to f5. Because, well, that's a very nice square for the knight. Since those pawns on e5 and g5 have been pushed so many squares up, it does weaken the square f5. So you have to be careful with that. C takes, queen takes. Should be four, knight b2, and here all of a sudden black is taking over. Velimir Ivich has the chance to, you know, gain an advantage here and perhaps even win this game. Rook c3, queen a2, king f8, and now knight bc4 is not a great move. And unfortunately for Velimir, he did not find the way to deal with this move. He played the move rook c8. Apparently, he had to make some move like bishop c8. I mean, that's absolutely madness. Why would you play bishop c8? Where is this bishop going to? It seems like this bishop needs to go to d7 to b5 to attack this knight on c4, but that takes so much time. Why would you spend so much time if you can play rook c8, right? But here's a problem. d6, there's a pawn marching in black's territory. Rook e8, and here Domas played the inaccurate move d7 which looks so logical but the engine is not having it the engine is very displeased with both players but what do you do it makes so much sense you're just attacking that rook rook d8 was played of course the only way to stop the pawn bishop takes pawn takes and here once again very big problems for black knight d6 a brilliant move opening up the queen from a2 threatening checkmate 
And you might think like, okay, but bishop takes d6. What is going on here? That's not, it's not like a free piece. Well, here is what Thomas calculated. Well, there's two different lines that white could play here. You can either play queen e6 to attack that bishop one more time and also threaten the queen takes f6. You can also decide to play knight f5 because it's almost like a discovery attack, right? Knight f5, rook takes f3, knight takes d6, and you're threatening to give a check queen one more time. And also, uh, of course, you're threatening to take the rook back. So that seems like a lot of trouble. And also queen e6 is still in the air. But of course, um, that is not what Vladimir played. Vladimir simply took on d7 because, well, this knight is now pinned pretty much, and this knight is also under attack. It's crazy, like, it feels like every single piece in white's position is hanging right now. However, queen c4 takes the queen, like, what? 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 What is going on? Why queen c4? Well, there are so many threats in the position, and of course, queen e6 is one of the biggest threats in the position. And how do you defend this? You don't really have a lot of choice. You need to cover this queen and get rid of it somehow, either by playing rook c4 or queen c4. And that was reason enough for Velimir Ivic to give away the queen. Knight takes c4, rook takes d1, king h2, rook c1, threatening checkmate, gotta be careful. King h3, bishop takes e4, king g4, another brilliant move played by Thomas Beardson. Bishop d5, queen a4, rook g1, queen e7, Taking on g2, rook g3, rook takes g3, knight takes, bishop takes c4. I mean, what is even going on in this game? Knight e4, bishop e7. You may feel like those bishops and rook should be enough to hold the position, right? I mean, look at how many pawns black has. That's a lot of pawns, you know, against the queen, knight, and two pawns that are not really doing much. But the problem is knight d6. Bishop e2, f3, rook g1, and this king is marching in black's territory, simply shielded by those pawns, and that is just a disastrous way to lose. Bishop takes d6, queen takes d6, queen e8, and now queen b8 check. And the reason why Velimir Ivic resigned here is because once the king gets to the 7th rank, which it has to go to right now, imagine king e7, there's queen a7, and goodbye rook because it's a check. And this is another win for Thomas Beardson. Really phenomenal game played by him. What a way to beat a Grandmaster higher rated than yourself. And let's see what Thomas will do in the final two rounds of the Tata Steel Chess Tournament. I hope you guys enjoyed this recap. Thank you so much for watching. Let me know which game was your favorite today. I hope to see you tomorrow. Tomorrow we'll have another recap. See you in the next video.